that we don't need to talk about today. Most people have an idea, but increases in cancer and things like that from drinking. But the effect that it has on our brain. So now I want to get into scripture. And before we, before we do that, I'd just like to pray one more time. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here today. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, Lord, and we know that uh, you made us to eat and drink in a certain way, and you've given us uh, the blueprint for that in your word. And as we look at that today, we just uh, pray that your spirit will guide us in this discussion and that your spirit will be here with us and your holy angels, Lord. Amen. So our scripture today is in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. And uh, you might say it doesn't have anything to do with alcohol. You'd be right, uh, but we'll get back to it later. Hosea 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. A lot of people today are rejecting knowledge that they can easily get, right? We have access to, but we don't want it because... We don't want to change our ways. So let's go ahead and um, look at Scripture now, the story um, in John chapter 2, real briefly, because I'm going to have to move pretty fast, John chapter 2. And uh, I saw in the bulletin there was a little insert there. The back of that is blank, so I'm not going to have you look up every verse that we go through, but if you want to write them down, you can look at them later. Uh, later. And you know the story, so we're not going to read it all, but Jesus and his disciples come to this wedding feast where Mary, his mother, is a relative of one of the people who's getting married, so she is help helping and helped in the preparation for this in this small town in Canaan. And they, they run out of wine before this is done, and so Mary goes to Jesus because it looks bad for the host of the wedding feast that run out of wine, and, and it looks bad on her too. The preparations weren't made enough, and she says, you know, we're out of wine, implying do something about it. And he has this conversation with her of, well, you know, it's, it's not my time, but then he does. He turns around, and you look in verse 7, and he says what? Um, she told him first, you know, do whatever he says. And look back in verse 6 first. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. This is the New King James Version. I looked in several versions. They say 20 to 30 gallons. And then the uh, King James Version says a furthing or something. Something different. So then you'd have to look and see what that is. So... <coughs> The first thing I do, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, and you, you have to start thinking, right? As we think about this and as we make our decisions, 20 to 30 gallons, let's just take the low end, 20 gallons, six of them, that's 120 gallons. That's a lot. If you're thinking that's alcohol, wine, that's a lot of wine. These towns were very small, and even if everybody in town was there and people from out of town, you're probably not talking about more than a couple hundred people, and there probably aren't that, probably aren't that many and you don't know how many more days left there were, but the typical serving of alcohol is five ounces, at least today it is. So that's 512 servings per jar, 3,072 servings if it's 20 gallons, 4,608 servings if it's um, 30 gallons per jar. So I, I'm done. It's not alcohol, right? Right there, it's preposterous to think that the Lord would provide 4,000 servings, 3,000 servings of alcohol for any reason. But really, when I thought about it, the amount doesn't even matter. I think the amount proves the point, but even a gallon, I don't, you know, he's, he's not going to do it. He's not going to provide something that we just saw inhibits our brains, does damage to our bodies, and even in, in small amounts. So, you know, I have to think when people come and say things like this, and this is what I really would wish I had been able to say that Sabbath evening when we were having worship, is just ask the obvious questions like that. One, 3,000 servings? You, you, 
You agree with that? Two, the question comes to my mind, <laughs> do you know the side effects of alcohol? How about this question? Do you think it's harder for him to make grape juice than alcohol wine? That's a silly question. But come on. Do you think it's harder for God to make that? So he just said, oh, I'll just make wine. It's easier. Um, does he not know that 5 to 10% of first-time drinkers will develop a problem with alcohol? The percentage is much higher if you have a family member, a parent, or even a grandparent, or somebody who's had an addiction problem. It's going to be much higher for a first-time drinker that they will have a problem. Um, but maybe that's just my logic. I'm relying on man's logic. I told you I was biased. I, you know, didn't think it was discussion. Somebody else has a different bias. And so I have to, I have to admit, in Scripture it says what? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It says that about me and everybody else. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. So we don't want to trust in our own heart. We don't want to test that. So we're going to test it by Scripture. And that's what I want to continue to do here today. What does God's word say? Um, so, like I said, we're not going to turn to every scripture because we're not going to have time to go to everyone, but you can write it down if you want. There is also a way to study the Bible, and God is not afraid of questions. He's not afraid for the true seeker to come and say, what is wrong with a little wine? The true seeker, he's not afraid. He's not afraid of the false seeker either, but... But you get the point. So, the, and the scripture says that, right? Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. And you know the rest of the verse too, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. But he asks us, he says, come on, let's, let's reason together, let's look. And how do we look when we're doing studies and when you're trying to study for yourself? How do you do that? That's Isaiah 28.10. We have instructions on how to study the Bible. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So we go through Scripture and we say, well, what does Scripture say? We can't just take one verse here or there because the other um, verse that you will hear or the other story you will hear is what Paul said to Timothy, Right? He said, Timothy, you need to drink a little less water and drink a little wine for your stomach ailments. That's in the Bible. So a lot of people will look at this story of Canaan. Jesus made wine. Paul told Timothy to drink wine. That's it. But they failed to see that um, that's not it. And when he says a little wine, I mean... You might need morphine occasionally, but you're not going to drink morphine or inject morphine every day, right? You're not going to put a drug into your system. And it's also interesting that the, the philosopher Aristotle, he lived before Christ, and Pliny, another great philosopher, actually lived during, or Pliny, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, lived during the time of Paul. And both of them explicitly say that grape juice should be taken for stomach ailments. So even when Paul said that you know, Timothy, you need to take a little wine. He could have just been saying, you need a little grape juice because that's what some of the uh, philosophers were teaching and, and people were teaching at that time. All right. So let's look back. Let's look at Scripture. First, just a few comments. You know that Proverbs, um, or a few verses here, Proverbs talks about it. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Strong drink would be what? Liquors, right? Um, so wine and strong drink. Proverbs 31, verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink. Another admonition, I wish the people who are running our country would follow. It is said heard it from several different places you know no meetings in government hardly take place without alcohol and after seeing this video can you imagine well you can imagine because you see the state our world is in and our country's in another verse in proverbs 23 verse 21 for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags 
Move on to Isaiah, Isaiah 5, 21 and 22. Isaiah 5, 21 and 22. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to mighty men at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. What does woe mean? Woe means judgment is coming. So you can say judgment is coming to those who are wise in their own minds and prudent in their own sight. Judgment is coming to mighty men who are drinking wine. Judgment is coming to valiant men for mixing intoxicating drink. Ephesians 5.18, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So, sometimes there's words we may, may not be totally sure of when we study too, right? But there's so many free resources today, we don't really have an excuse for not understanding a verse. I mean, on our phones, you can have commentaries, concordances, everything, even a simple dictionary. And so when I study, I'm oftentimes turning either, I do have commentaries, hardback, I like books, but I also use my phone. Um, just looking up the words, dissipation, dissipation, the squandering of money, energy, and resources. And do not drink, be drunk with wine, because what? In which is the squandering of money, energy, and resources. You've never seen that happen, have you? Or you can also just um, look at it in a different version, like the Amplified version. One of the things about one of the Bible apps that I have that I really enjoy is I can read in whatever version I want. And if there's a verse I don't totally understand, you know, I can just click on it and compare, and it'll bring up five other versions for that verse. And so, and you can change the versions. It doesn't, it's not a set thing. So I can read it in different versions. I always like to look at the amplified version. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is wickedness, corruption, stupidity, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by him. That's the amplified version of that. So, I mean, that's kind of an overview. We went from the Old Testament to the New Testament, just looking at a, a few verses and, and what it says about wine strong drink. Now, I want you to go back to Genesis 9. This is the first story in the Bible, as far as I know, um, that talks about wine. Verse 20, Genesis 9, verse 20. This is talking about Noah and Noah after the flood, right? And Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk. Now, this is actually a little ways after the flood because as we look down further, you'll see that it ends up with a, a curse on Canaan, which is Ham's son. So it has to be long enough for Canaan to actually have been born and grown old enough to know his disposition. Um, so he drank, he got drunk, and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see the father's nakedness. Nakedness in scripture is always equated, not always, but most times equated with shame. This story is shortly after the story of the fall, right? And Adam and Eve sinned, and what? They noticed that they were naked. They were ashamed. Um, so Noah, one of the greatest men in the Bible, he is the one that God used to offer salvation to the antediluvian world. Unfortunately, no one accepted except for his family, but he is the progenitor of the race, or not progenitor, but the completion of the race because um, he was used by God. He was a prophet preaching for 120 years. He's one of the greatest men in the Bible. And he gets drunk to his shame. Um, you know, he's naked in his tent. And Ham and Canaan are kind of laughing. Look at Dad, this great man, this man of God. But the point is, what did that to this great man of God? Wine. Wine. All right. Now here's a story. You all know very well. You can flip over to Daniel. Look at another, another story here. Daniel 1. 
And um, we're just briefly going to go through this. Starting in verse 3, the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. This is great. This is a good place to end up if you're coming, being brought as a slave from another country, Right? You could be out in the chain gang somewhere or, or have already been killed. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So now you know Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're among those people those that were brought. And you look down at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not, what? Defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, so the rich food, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So Daniel felt that what he ate and what he drank could have an uplifting nature or could have a what? a defiling nature on him. So he did, and you know the test. They tested for 10 days, and they were found to be fairer and fatter. I like that word. 10 years, we don't like that word anymore. Hey, <laughs> look, in 10 days, you're fatter than you were. But, but that's fullness. Have you ever seen someone who is like smoked for years and years and years? Their skin kind of, it just, it doesn't have what we call turgor, meaning the natural fluids that should be in your skin. And as we age, we kind of get that way too, but they age faster. They had a full, healthy, you know, glowing look. They were, they were healthy. So at the end of the days, um, they were what? They were tested then, right? They're tested by the king himself in verses 19 and 20. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before their king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Now, it would be hard to be ten times smarter that ten is a, um, means thoroughly better or smarter. It's not the number ten. They were head and shoulders above everyone else that he tested. Okay? Because they did not do what? They did not defile themselves with the king's delicacy or with wine. All right. What else do we find in Scripture? Well, if we go back to the Old Testament and look in Numbers, Numbers chapter 2, I take that back, Numbers chapter 6. There was a vow that people could take. It was a vow that dedicated them to the Lord. You know what that vow was? In the Old Testament, the Nazarite vow. Vow of the Nazarites, which had three components to it. And in verses 2 to 5, it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord. So when you took this vow, you were doing what? separating yourself to the Lord, okay? He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat gra uh, fresh grapes or raisins all the days of his separation. He shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin all the days of the vows of his separation. And also, what? No razor shall come onto his head until the time has been fulfilled. And they could also not do one other thing, touch something that was unclean. So in the Bible, there were not only people who could take this vow for a period of time, and I didn't find anything about how long that was, but we also know that there were people who were dedicated from birth to be Nazarites from birth, right? 
Um, one of the first ones, if not the first one, was Samson. Okay, so Judges 13, you, can, you don't have to turn there, but Judges, in Judges 13, we see not only was Samson a Nazarite from birth, but his mother, doesn't say that she was a Nazarite, kind of had to take the Nazarite vow because the angel of the Lord, in Jesus, when he talked to her, he said, now therefore, please be careful, talking to the mother, not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So not only was it important for Samson, who we know had quite a meandering story to his life, because he did not follow the vows of the Nazarite. He broke, ended up breaking them all, right? But we see here in Scripture that what the mother does and now we know, too, scientifically, that the father, too, the parents do, has an effect on their children. They have the tendencies. What did I mention earlier? If someone has an alcoholic relative, they're much higher if they drink to have that problem. It's not 100%, but it goes from like 5 to 10% to almost 40%. Okay. So and those are called epigenes. You may have heard genes. The genes don't change. The epigenes change. And you can think of epigenes as being the switches that turn genes on and off. And, and so those genes can get flipped on. And here, so the Lord is telling her, you can't drink because what you do affects your children. So up here, we were talking about he was showing you know, drinking what it does to the brain and everything. But of course, we know about fetal alcohol syndrome for mothers who drink a lot, but um, the effect that even alcohol can have on your children, maybe even your grandchildren. Okay? Samuel was a Nazarite from birth. He did follow God's ways, right? Who else was a Nazarite from birth? Who? John the Baptist. Um, so John the Baptist, he was told, or, or Elizabeth was told specifically, you know, he would not drink any wine or strong drink. That's in Luke 1, 13 to 15. I won't go there, but you can check it out later. John the Baptist, Jesus called him the greatest prophet, right? The prophet who heralded the Messiah. He was a Nazarite. All right, one last story. Um, let's go to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. My Bible has the caption right over this, the profane fire of Nadab and Abihu. Okay? Chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went from the Lord and devoured them, and they, did, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all people, I must be glorified. So those people who come near to Jesus, those who come near, must be regarded as holy, and I must be glorified. God, right? So what, what we do. Now, a lot of people look at this story and they think, man, God is harsh. Right? This, is, this story happens right at the beginning of the temple sanctuary service, okay? And what I mean by that is, you remember the story, Moses goes up on the mountain, he gets the Ten Commandments, he comes down, he breaks them because the people have apostatized, he goes back, gets them again, they go through a period of, you know, confession and repentance, and they build the tabernacle, the, the, the temple in the wilderness, the tabernacle. 
and they're about eight or nine, eight days in, I think, if you look here, the Aaron and his sons have been um, consecrated at this point. Nadab and Abihu are like three and four in the pecking order. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu in Israel. They were up on the mountain with Moses and the 70 elders. Only Moses went to the top, but remember, there was like 70 elders that went part way up. And they had experiences that no one else in Israel had besides this group. And then, of course, Moses had more of an experience because he was, you know, the leader. So here they are, and we don't know right there what, what happened. But it is interesting. I mean, the question in my mind is, well, let me back up a little. I purposely left the spirit of prophecy out of this sermon. And there was a reason I did that, not because I don't love the spirit of prophecy. I do, and you should know that if you've ever heard me talk before. But when you're talking to people about this subject, there's two groups of people primarily that you talk to. One is non avenist of course, right? And so they have, they don't understand the spirit of prophecy, or if they've heard anything about it, it's negative. So if you're going to talk to them and go through points with them, we need to just be able to take it from Scripture. So that's one of the reasons I didn't. The second reason is, is an unfortunate reason, because when I looked up on the Internet, there's about 12% of Avenists is what they say that drink. Okay, about 12%. So if you're talking to an Avenist who is arguing a counterpoint, this counterpoint with you, they don't believe in the spirit of prophecy either. Because if they did, they wouldn't be arguing with you. So I wanted to keep everything in scripture this morning. But she adds a lot to the story, and you can go back and read it. And it, it's in scripture too, where she talks about them, how, how they were honored um, in their position as Aaron's son, and they've just been consecrated. Um, but we have to look down to see the reason, really. We need to look down to verses 8 through 10. Because at first, you don't know why, except for that they had unholy fire. And, and the unholy fire was maybe a fire from their own fire pits at their tent. There was holy fire, like I said, when they uh, consecrated the tabernacle, God sent fire from heaven, and the altar was lit. They had a fire from God, okay? Which meant, and we studied this in prayer meeting, when, when you have a sacrifice, which they were sacrificing, and God sends fire, that means that God accepted the sacrifice. So what did I just say? They had been repenting, they had committed this heinous crime right after God had come down the mountain. He had preached to them himself. And then they had turned around, built a golden calf, worshipped it, and were headed back to Egypt, which means they were headed away from God back to sin. Okay? They had repented. They built the tabernacle. And now they're consecrating themselves to God. And God sends fire down, which says, I accept you back I accept you back right and these guys drink say oh I've got to go do the afternoon sacrifice they pick up their sensors throw some coals in and, and run to do their service so how do we know that from scripture well, verse 8, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between the holy and the unholy, between the unclean and the clean. So again, we see that, that you may distinguish. Why will you be able to distinguish between the holy and the unholy? and the clean and the unclean? Because you are not what? You don't drink wine or intoxicating drinks. That's what it said, verse 9, that you may distinguish. They could not distinguish between God's fire, I mean, fire looks like fire, 
in any fire. And that's what they said in their minds. Their minds were clouded, right? Oh, fire is fire. That burns. So God says that. Now, you may be thinking, hmm, I'm not a great leader like Samson was supposed to be. I'm not a great prophet like Samuel. I'm not a great prophet like John the Baptist. I'm not the son of the high priest. So how does this relate to me? Maybe it is all right for me. Because I'm none of those things. Well, are you sure? Do you need to be able to distinguish between clean and unclean and between holy and unholy? Yeah, you do. But there's more. Have you dedicated yourself to Christ? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Now, I hope here in this audience you have. Um, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you been baptized? You accepted Christ? Have you put on Christ? But there's more. Let's go back to the scripture today. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me. Hmm. From being what for me? Priests. Do you know in, who's, in Hosea who he was talking to? Was he talking to the Levites? He wasn't. This was to all of Israel. Hosea was a prophet to the northern tribes of Israel, right? And here God is saying, I will reject you from being priests from me because you have rejected knowledge. Okay? How about the New Testament? 1 Peter 2 9. You all know these verses. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, I think this is the most important story. That's why I saved it for last. Because Nadab and Abihu are priests. Priests are supposed to, what? Follow God, for sure. They are the teachers. And here... Both in the Old Testament, Hosea, God says to his chosen people at that time, you have rejected me, I've rejected you as priest. Peter says, you are a chosen generation. So who is Peter talking to? You better be pointing your finger at yourself if you said you accepted Jesus. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation, his own special people, right? And what, what did I read in Leviticus? Talking to the priest. Are you following me? Are you a priest? I hope so. Talking to the priest. Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean. To me, that's pretty clear. Just a couple more, and I'm done here. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right? How about that one? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you want holy fire? Meaning the Holy Spirit to live in you? Or do you want unholy fire? Native Americans, as far as I can tell, they used to call alcohol what? Fire water? I thought that was kind of interesting fire water, unholy fire water. 
Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. All these verses are not new. These are verses we read all the time. 1 Corinthians 6.15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. What's a harlot? A prostitute. Our bodies are members of Christ. Should we take our bodies and prostitute them to the devil? Certainly not. So, as I thought back on, you know, on this subject, I couldn't find anything in scripture that would give me the least idea that that would be okay or that my Savior would make 120 gallons of alcohol. When I get to heaven and sit at that table and he's saying he's not going to drink, what did he say? I'm not going to drink of the vine until I drink it with you. And it's going to be non-alcoholic. We're not going to go to heaven and forget the first week we had there. We are going to remember every precious moment that we have with our Savior. And he wants us to start now. Right? He wants us to start now. Now, I hope we've already started, but if we haven't, what did he do with the Israelites? He accepted their repentance and their sacrifice, and he sent holy fire. And he accepts our sacrifice, I mean our sacrifice, he accepts our repentance and our confession, and he will send us the Holy Spirit. Are we preparing our hearts and our minds and keeping our bodies in such a way that he can give us that gift to each one of us and then our church will be a Holy Spirit filled church. I know he is. I hope you do too. I hope if anybody asks you or makes a comment about that again, We'll have some good answers for them. Praise the Lord that he has given us his word. We have to read it. have prayer and leave while the thoughts are still there but number 590 is trust and obey seems like it'll work please stand with me when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory Sign or a tear can abide. 
to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he says to trust and obey. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us beyond belief. You call us your children, a royal priesthood, a holy generation. May we follow your words, Lord. May we live the life that you want us to live here so that we can live the life you want us to live with you soon. Thank you for your amazing love. Amen.